Welcome to Pleasant Green Sunday School. This is Lesson 9 for October the 29th, 2017. We're still in Unit 2, entitled Called into Covenant with God. Our topic for today, taken from the Adult Quarterly, is Sign on the Dotted Line. Our devotional reading comes out of Psalm 103, uh, verses 1 through 14. And our background scripture is taken from Nehemiah chapters 9 and 10. And we'll be studying today uh, from the book of Nehemiah chapter 9 uh, verses 32 through 38. And also chapter 10 uh, verses 28 and 29. Our key verse reads, In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. This is taken from Nehemiah chapter 9 uh, verse 33 from the NIV translation. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to study the prayer recorded in Nehemiah chapter 9 for repentance and covenant uh, affirmation. Two, to regret sinful attitudes and actions both personal and corporate in which you are complicit. And thirdly, is to express your commitment to following God's ways in daily life. We have just two outlines today that uh, will be the focus of our study today. Uh, our first uh, outline is entitled A Confession of National Unfaithfulness. And then our second outline is entitled, A Pledge to Obey. And certainly I thank and praise God for this yet another blessed opportunity to be able to share God's word through this Sunday School lesson with you. And we hope that you will uh, grab your Bible and uh, something that you can uh, record some notes. And we're going to share some scripture with you today as we study this lesson uh, to see what we can learn from this historical account. But I want to tell you just a little bit, uh, there's so much history here, we obviously won't be able to cover it all, but uh, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah uh, were originally a single book uh, composed from a variety of historical sources, including the uh, personal memoirs of Ezra and Nehemiah. So according to Jewish tradition, Ezra was responsible for compiling these sources um, into their current form. So he would be, in that context, the author um, of this writing. Uh, but our biblical context for uh, this lesson taken from the quarterly, as God had promised following the prophesied number of years of captivity or the exile, the remnant of the nation of Israel was permitted to return to Palestine uh, by a decree of Cyrus. Zerubbabel uh, led a feeble remnant uh, back to their home where they laid the foundation for the temple in uh, 536 BC. Ezra, a learned scribe versed in the law, of Moses followed uh, in 458 BC and restored the law and religious worship. So 14 years later in 444 BC, uh, Nehemiah led a company of Jews back and succeeded in restoring the walls of Jerusalem and civil authority. And during his ministry, a national revival occurred as a result of the reading and explanation of the law. You can find this in Nehemiah chapter 8. And then the Word of God had a tremendous impact on the restoration community. It pointed the people to their sin, led them to worship, and gave them uh, great joy. All of this you can find in Nehemiah chapter 8. And we hope that you will go back and read um, uh, Nehemiah chapters 8. Uh, 9 and 10 and also if you can study 
uh, the book of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah together uh, since they were contemporaries uh, that would be uh, awesome for you to be able to get the full scope of uh, what we are studying today and you will find that uh, uh, some of the same material that uh, is recorded in Ezra is also recorded uh, in the book of Nehemiah but a little bit more of this historical account uh, I want to share with you today uh, God's people in the northern kingdom of Israel had been conquered by the Assyrians in 722 BC uh, to the south, the kingdom of Judah fell to Babylon in uh, 586 BC, but the time of captivity in Babylon that followed was not a period uh, in grammatical terms as though it marked the end of God's people. It was a comma, a pause uh, during which God disciplined his wayward people with the intent uh, to bring them back home. Uh, and, and just a little bit more, there were three uh, return trips to Judah after Cyrus's decree. You can uh, find this back over in um, I, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24, and also in the 45th chapter of the book of Isaiah, verse 1 and 2. I'm sorry, just verse 1, and then Second Chronicles uh, chapter 36, verses uh, 22 and uh, 23 but the first uh, return trip was in 538 BC led by Zerubbabel and uh, Shazbazer and Jeshua so about uh, 50,000 made the trip you can see this back over in the book of Ezra uh, chapters 1 through chapter 6 the second journey came uh, about uh, 458 BC when Ezra traveled to Judah uh, you can see this in Ezra chapter 8 uh, and so the reason he went back uh, was to provide some needed spiritual guidance you can see this in Ezra chapter 7 uh, verses 6 through 10 and then the third journey was led by Nehemiah uh, in 444 uh, BC we know that uh, Nehemiah was the cupbearer for the king of Persia uh, when he learned the distressing news that the walls of Jerusalem still lay in ruins. You can see that back over in the first chapter of the book of Nehemiah. And that was uh, nearly a hundred years after the first return uh, to Judah. And so Nehemiah felt compelled to rectify this situation personally so the city could prop properly defend itself from attack. Uh, and so thanks to Nehemiah's steady, courageous, and prayerful leadership, the wall was completed uh, in less than two months. That's back over in uh, Ezra, I'm sorry, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. So Nehemiah, working with Ezra, understood that while protecting the city physically was vital, maintaining the spiritual defenses uh, of the people was even more critical. I want you to pin that. Uh, we know about the physical wall uh, that uh, uh, the children of Israel subsequently built, but but the spiritual uh, part of this, um, Israel needed work. Uh, they needed spiritual defense uh, for the people. It says here was even more critical. As we study this lesson today, I want to give you a word that I want you to think about as we go through uh, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 32 through 38, and chapter 10, verse 28, 29. The word is retrospect. Uh, this lesson is all about looking back, if you take into account all of the prayer uh, that uh, that is given in Nehemiah chapter 9, we come to uh, and our study today in the printed text, uh, uh, the conclusion, if you will, um, uh, the summary of, uh, of this entire prayer, but the entire chapter, um, uh, the ninth chapter of Nehemiah uh, deals with retrospect. It deals with what God has done, what uh, the faithfulness of God with his people and the disobedience um, of Israel to keep their part 
uh, and this caused them as we read earlier to fall into enemy hands uh, and so as we get into this lesson today in this first outline a confession of national unfaithfulness a confession of national unfaithfulness uh, so uh, Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 32 through 38 the Bible says now therefore our God the great the mighty and terrible God who keep keep his covenant and mercy let not all the trouble seem little before thee uh, that hath come up on us on our kings on our princesses on our priests and on our prophets and on our fathers and on all thy people since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. Uh, verse 33 How be it thou art just in all that is brought upon us for thou hast done right but we have done wickedly. Verse 34 Neither have our kings, our princesses, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law nor hearkened unto thy commandments uh, and thy testimonies wherewith thou didst testify against them but they have not served thee in their kingdom and in thy great goodness that thou gavest them in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them neither turn they from their wicked works verse 36 behold we are servants this day and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yielded much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle and their pleasure at their pleasure and we are in great distress. Verse 38. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princesses, Levites, uh, and priests seal unto it. There's quite a bit to unpack here, but as we deal with uh, the confession of national unfaithfulness, let's understand that Israel uh, is already in a covenant with God. Uh, they have been in this covenant. Uh, since God chose them uh, long before they uh, left Egyptian bondage. This is what this prayer uh, in the ninth chapter of Nehemiah focuses on. It's, it's an account or a recount, if you will, of all of the goodness uh, that has uh, uh, come up on Israel uh, because of the covenant and the terms thereof. Uh, and so God had blessed them tremendously but as we look at this uh, Babylonian campaign uh, where the Babylonians uh, under uh, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, uh, conquered Jerusalem and uh, took them into captivity now we're looking at uh, post-exile uh, activities we're looking at the fact that they have completed uh, uh, the 70 years of captivity just as the Lord had prophesied uh, that would come up on them uh, and now they are in a place and I want you to get this in your mind they have lost everything everything that God had given to them their place uh, uh, their dwelling the, the temple uh, uh, all of the articles of the temple they have lost everything uh, the city is laid waste uh, there are ruins everywhere the people are coming out of captivity and they are thinking about uh, or at least through this prayer all that God has done for them and they are taking responsibility uh, for what they have not done and so as the text tells us today therefore so which means we have to go back uh, God has kept uh, his covenant, his part. He has uh, 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 had mercy 
uh, on them and what they're asking God to do in this prayer is let not all the trouble seem little before them uh, before thee and so what they are literally saying to God is that we we know what you have done for us in the past and their uh, hope and expectation even through this prayer is that God would do it uh, uh, for them again that he would come to their aid that he would see the distress of his people that he would uh, uh, reproduce if you will his faithfulness at this time where they are at their lowest point so be, uh, because of God's faithfulness to Israel uh, is a repeated theme in this prayer of confessed sin historically they had been devastated by rebellion and sin but when they repented and God delivered them so although they continued to sin the remnant uh, confessed that his great mercy uh, God did not utterly destroy nor did he abandon them you can see that in Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 31 so following the summary of the relationship between God and his people the Levites appealed to God to take note of the hardships uh, Israel had experienced from the days of the kings of Assyria until today so what does that mean for us today uh, do we look back uh, do we recount the fact that God has been, you know, when you read this prayer, it is a very lengthy prayer. And there's a lot of details in the ninth chapter uh, of, of the book of Nehemiah. It fully discloses everything that God has done and his efforts and his, his, his mercies upon mercies and grace upon grace. And, and, and I could just see myself uh, in this text that God has been good to me as far back as I can go in my memory uh, God was there uh, but I did not always uh, keep the commandments none of us have uh, even individually uh, uh, or rather we speak corporately but what we are depending on is the faithfulness of God and, and, and we have to do uh, what uh, the children of uh, of Israel or Judah at this time respectively are doing they are going back and they are reflecting uh, and they are looking at where they have fallen short and we're going to share some things uh, a little bit later uh, that will help us understand but uh, what uh, Judah did they acknowledged their disobedience of their political and religious leaders uh, they acknowledged the fact they didn't walk up right uh, uh, before God, and, but they were enjoying the blessings in the land God had given them. But now they were slaves in the land. That's what it means that they were servants. They were literally slaves uh, 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 in the land of their heritage. They were unable to enjoy it. Uh, but subject to the whims of the king of Persia. So based on God's past goodness to the nation, they asked him for a new beginning and made a solemn covenant to obey his law and do his will. Have we ever asked God for a new beginning, for a do-over? Uh, I was thinking about uh, uh, years ago as I grew up in the church uh, we would do this religiously on first Sunday and what uh, our congregation was small enough for us to do this but everyone in the congregation individually stood up and apologized and what they did what they said was if I have offended you uh, from last first Sunday to this first Sunday please forgive me and this ritual went on uh, uh, consistently uh, prior to taking the Lord's Supper and it, it brought about our confession not only to God but to the people that we had offended we did not want to take uh, or participate in the Lord's Supper 
uh, with ought in our heart against our brothers and our sisters. And I'm bringing this up because God commanded us to love one another. Uh, this is a part of the law. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, our, all of our strength uh, and our neighbors. Uh, we have to love them as well. So, But what we do today uh, uh, on First Sunday, we are told from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to let a man examine himself. So what would we be looking for? We would have to know the law. Uh, and that's what Judah had failed to do. They had failed to uphold their part of the Mosaic law. And now it has caused them to go into captivity uh, uh, for 70 years. They have come out of captivity. And now they have to go back and get that law, the Mosaic law that they had put aside, that they did not want to obey. And now they have to start uh, uh, putting into place uh, 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 the actual uh, component of doing what the Lord had told them to do. So there's a question here in the commentary. What can we learn from Israel's action? When God calls us into a covenant relationship with him, he expects submissive obedience. And all of us that say we are of the body of Christ, we are in a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. We are in a covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so we accept the terms of that covenant. How did we get saved uh, is a part of that covenant. Jesus dying on the cross and shedding his blood. It's a part of that covenant. And when we uh, 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 commemorate and we celebrate the Lord's Supper by participating in it, we, we agree that this is the act that brought us into this fellowship. We, we agree that this is the means by which we are saved. We agree that, that Jesus is the mediator between God and man. And we agree that the death that Jesus died, he died to sin. And we agree that the blood he shed for uh, on us on Calvary, uh, uh, was to atone for our sinfulness from the past, from the present, and from the future. And we agree that when Jesus uh, uh, got up on the third day that he rose for our justification. And so we agree with all of these things as we uh, uh, examine ourselves. And what we are looking for is our failure to, to, to abide by the terms uh, uh, of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And so uh, uh, we need time to be able to reflect. And as I was studying this lesson, I was thinking about uh, uh, one of the things that, that keeps us, as the question is asked here in the quarterly, what are some barriers that prevent uh, confession of sin among the members of the community of faith. And that's what I said earlier. We fail to uh, appreciate uh, 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 the, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And some of those barriers can be our pride. Some of those barriers can be our unconfessed sin that we haven't done anything. And it is a huge problem in the body of Christ uh, today. And it was a problem with the nation of Israel when the Lord would send prophets and uh, his servants to them time and time again to warn them they did not heed uh, uh, that word they did not accept that correction and that warning uh, and so uh, I was thinking about the Lord talking to Ezekiel uh, uh, in the third chapter and telling him that they that the nation of Israel would not listen to him uh, uh, because it would not listen to their God. And so uh, they were hard headed and they were stiff necked. And so these things become barriers and, and they uh, and it prevents us from confessing when we believe that we are not guilty of anything. Uh, then we make God out to be a liar as uh, the first epistle of John chapter 1 tells us if any man say he does not have a fault he is a lie and the truth is not in him and so what we need to do is 
take a look at ourselves in the mirror of the Word of God and see if we have fallen short and then we have to confess our mouth has to open up and ask for forgiveness of these things to restore the brokenness of the fellowship between you and God and this is what the nation of Israel Judah respectively has to learn through captivity and I think that's a huge word in the context of this lesson and even as we look at the body of Christ today when we fail to apply these principles to our lives from the Word of God we fall into captivity we fall into the enemy's hand and so this is what has happened uh, 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 to Judah but they have come out and, and thank God for the ninth chapter of Nehemiah this is what God wants to hear uh, uh, God wants us to pray and someone took it upon themselves in the ninth chapter of, of Nehemiah to say God we are guilty we know that you've been good to us we know that you brought us out uh, with a mighty and an outstretched arm. We know that, 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 that our clothes didn't wear out and our shoes didn't wear out and you kept all of the, uh, the, the diseases from us and you shielded us from all of our enemies. Lord, we know it was you, but we have not acted as we should. I think that is huge. And so some things uh, you just can't deny. There's no getting around the fact that God has been good and he is good. There's no no way to get around the fact that God has been better to us than we have been to ourselves. I hope that you're getting this. I hope that you are, are writing this down and I hope that you are going to go back and look at this uh, awesome prayer in the ninth chapter of the book of Nehemiah and I hope that it humbles you in a way uh, it certainly has that effect upon me and I, I, I just thank God that, 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 that we have an opportunity now to look at the, the, the laws of God and we have a, a requirements to obey God rather we are talking about the New Te the Old Testament or the New Testament so the second outline a pledge a pledge to obey. Uh, uh, this is taken from Nehemiah chapter 10 verses 28 and 29 and so I'm going to read this from the NIV translation. The rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, musicians, temple servants and all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who are able to understand verse 29 says all these now join their fellow Israelites the nobles and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses the servant of God and to obey carefully all the commands the regulations and decrees of the law of the law of the Lord our God or of the Lord our Lord I'm sorry but back over in Deuteronomy read this at your leisure Deuteronomy chapters 27 and 28 in the law were blessings for obedience also in the law were curses for their disobedience so all of this was already in play uh, if you will it was already in the law it was nothing that that they could have added it was already there God had already said that's the reason why they ended up in captivity is because that was under that indictment of disobedience that that the enemy uh, would come up on you you should really read that because uh, Moses told the children of Israel uh, how they would be blessed and he also told them how they would be cursed he told them all the things that the Lord would do uh, uh, and to their good and then he told them uh, about the things that that would come up on them as a result of uh, of their disobedience but humbled into submission and the acknowledgement of their sins by the reading of the law 
the people led by the Levites uh, at this time, they agreed to make, write, and seal a covenant with the law. This is Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 38. Listen to this. 84 persons, including Nehemiah, the priests, the Levites, and other leaders, put their seal on the covenant they made to the Lord. Ne this is Nehemiah chapter 10 verses 1 through 27. Other men uh, who did not physically sign the covenant, including their wives and children, agreed to abide by its stipula stipulations. I want to pause here for a minute because I want to under want us to understand uh, of what it means uh, when we bring situations up on ourselves by disobeying God that affect other people. I, I want you to think about that for a minute. Don't ever think that 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 the sin uh, or the disobedience of God's word affects you only. It affects all of the people around you. It affects the people of your household. It affects the people at the church. Uh, I wonder why all of the children of Israel, all of Judah, went into captivity. What had happened uh, uh, in that case happens today. God sent all of them into captivity. So whoever was committing the sin caused the entire nation of Judah to be affected. They caused all uh, the nation of Israel that think about their children think about their wives think about their uh, servants think about their animals think about the temple the place of worship all of these things were uh, 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 easy pickings if you will for the enemy and some of them died some of them died by the edge of the sword some of them died by a uh, famine uh, uh, some of them uh, 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 were caused to stumble and fall. So this type of disobedience, when God uh, uh, entered the covenant with Israel, he entered into it with them as a nation. And I want you to remember that. They were all in it together. What affected one affected all. And that's how it is today. When we decide not to obey God we cause conditions to come up on those whom we love if you think that a son if you will if, if I can use this uh, example if a son commits a crime and 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 he gets uh, arrested and he becomes incarcerated don't you know that affects the entire family don't you know that affects his mother, his father, his sisters, his brothers, his children? That situation affects the whole household. And so uh, as, a, as a, 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 a spiritual application to this, when we let the devil in, he is not limited to the room where we allowed him to come in. Satan's intent is to run the house. Satan's intent is to run the entire house. Satan, uh, uh, his uh, intent is in, his intent is to affect everyone in the house, and so what will help us qualify this is Genesis chapter three. So uh, 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 he got into that garden situation through the wife to the husband, and it affected the whole garden situation. So that's how it is and that's what is happening here. But thank God this remnant that have come out of captivity were now obligating themselves to obey all of God's commandment under the threat of a curse if they failed to do so. The remnant agreed to separate themselves from those uh, around them and unite to obey God's law sacrifices are huge in the body of Christ. We have to separate ourselves, consecrate if you will, ourselves from things that that don't pertain to what we believe and 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 what we ascribe to as Christians. Uh and this is a huge problem for us today. We're not going to have time to get into it, but consecration is on the table. And that's what uh, uh Judah has done here. And also uh, it is both challenging and convicting to us today when we see the result of the word just being 
uh, read, explained, and understood. So how often is the word read, taught, and preached in our presence and we are moved to obey it in immediately without discussion or debate? That's a good question. Uh, uh, so it may be necessary for us to examine our relationships and determine if there are those we need to separate ourselves from in order to obey God's word and be in his will for our lives. This is a challenge for us today. This is difficult for us today. Some of these things and some of these people are in, are, 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 are in our immediate families. They are in our uh, intimate circles. Uh, and it's very difficult sometimes for us to make that kind of decision. But let me say this to you. It's, it's worthy of something that we need to be praying about and asking God to help us with. If it is causing us uh, uh, problems in our relationship with God. If it's causing us uh, to get into situations that we should not be. We need to be praying about that and asking God to help us uh, uh, in these situations. But the uh, the nation Judah at this time knew it was necessary for them to consecrate themselves and get back to uh, uh, what had uh, they had left, if you will, and get back to obeying God's word is the point I want to make. But the the question is asked here: What are some specific ways to demonstrate? Uh, our commitment to God both individually and collectively in response to his faithfulness to us. I, I was just looking at the book of Hebrews and I want you to take a look at these at your leisure in Hebrew chapter 5. I want you to look at uh, uh, particularly verses 12 through 14 and then I want you to continue on to Hebrews chapter 6 uh, uh, verses 1 through 8. If we uh, and I will summarize these two scriptures in this fashion. If we are eating and digesting the word of God as we should, and we are praying as we should, we should be growing as we should. We should be moving ahead in doctrine, in fellowship, we should be moving ahead in instruction. In other words, we ought to be able to eat some meat now. And rather, rather than just drinking milk. My point is, the children of Israel, though they may have known the law, they did not digest the law. They did not take it into account. They did not fully make it applicable to their everyday everyday lives therefore they were not growing as the covenant required what I mean by that is that if you go back to the exodus and if you go back to the instructions that God gave Israel prior to entering uh, the promised land if we go back to Ezra and if we go back to Nehemiah and we take these two books into account, the nation of Israel should have grown in the laws of God that they should have been an example to the environment or to the nations or to the world where God had dispossessed the Canaanite nation and gave it to his people. Israel was told, don't serve the gods that they serve don't intermarry with them don't take their sons don't take their daughters but be an example that's how you know you're growing in the knowledge of the truth when someone wants to serve the God that you serve wants to be in fellowship with the God that you are in fellowship with. When we can be the type of evangelists, when we can be the kind of witnesses, as Jesus says to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, you will be my witness. That's the intent. That was the intent in the Old Testament and is also the intent in the New Testament. 
we are nothing but witnesses for Jesus Christ. But how we are witnessing and how we are uh, uh, growing that we are able to demonstrate that to the world at large is all locked into this covenant. It's not just for us, but it's for others. I hope that you can understand this and I hope that you can appreciate these scriptures uh, uh, and, and this law uh, in this prayer, this awesome prayer that comes out of the ninth chapter of the book of Nehemiah. I pray that the law will bless and impress upon you to go back and read this and let this text bless you, let it bless your life, and let it bless those around you. I want to offer this closing prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your transforming word to help us live as you desire. Open our hearts through the Holy Spirit so that we are always conscious of our need for confession and repentance as we read, study, and apply your word to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It has certainly been a joy for me to share this with you today. And until such time that the Lord will permit us to come together again, we say God bless you.